Hey, Norman. Pastor Norman, hey, 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 come here. You know this guy is quite the quarterback of uh, Grace Bible Church. But uh, let's see what happens when he puts this on. Oh. Right, come on, put it on quickly. Any Seahawk fans in here? Go Hawks. Hey, he's taller than Russell Wilson. <laughs> wow. All right. Hey, now, because he put this jersey on, does it change his identity? No, because your jersey doesn't determine your identity. Your performance doesn't determine your identity. Your Instagram and Facebook accounts don't determine your identity. God and what he says about you and who he makes you to be is your identity. And this man is a soul with a character and a set of relationships from God and his wife and his family and you. It's not even Pastor Norman, the famous right. cool guy who's off the hook crazy. He is off the hook crazy. <laughs> no, he's God's son. And you are God's daughter or God's son. Thanks for wearing my jersey. You look good in it. Yeah, Fill it out nicely. <laughs> Have a seat. I do want to back. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, thank you that we can laugh. And most importantly, though, thank you that we can learn more about you and find out who we are from you. So guide me to say only what agrees with your word and what points to Jesus. And guide each person by the Holy Spirit to know that they are here for a reason. Help them get rid of all the junk that's in their head and their heart. What's distracting them? Help us worship you fully right now and listen to you fully and hear what you want each of us to hear that we might be changed to be more like Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. I was a rookie, and uh, I went to training camp at Cal State Fullerton, California, and uh, there were no veteran football players for the first week. They used to work us hard. We would have two practices a day, every day for seven days straight. Today, man, these guys that are paid a lot, they're pansies. They have it really easy. They get to go to Hawaii to play their preseason games. <laughs> Gosh, I hope they keep coming. But it was all rookies, no veterans, no superstars, just you know, 50 of us, and they might keep 10 or 12. And I was a free agent out of Dartmouth. No one predicted that I would be able to play. I was just kind of an extra arm to throw in the camp so the other quarterbacks didn't get tired. And uh, after practice one day, a little boy, eight years old, came up to me and said, can I carry your helmet for you? I gave it to him. He carried it off the field to the locker room, half a mile. Next morning, rode his bike over there, and he, drove his, he carried uh, my helmet and my pads out to practice, watched practice, carried it back, was there for afternoon practice, did the same back and forth, three days in a row. And I'm the only rookie that I can see who has a personal equipment caddy. <laughs> and I'm thinking, hey, I'm a pretty big deal. And we were on a first name basis. This eight-year-old kid, after three days, looks at me and says, hey, Jeff, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. I thought he'd ask for an autograph, a tip on throwing the ball. He goes, Jeff, when do the good guys come to training camp? <laughs> Put me in my place. I love that story because, number one, he was doing the single greatest human characteristic that we could do as creations of God. He was serving. And Jesus didn't come to be what? That's not rhetorical. You can answer me. Jesus didn't come to be what? Served, but to serve. So I think that would make sense for an imperfect Jeff to be a server rather than a servee. And the same for all of us. And then the second thing that's, that little boy gave me is he gave me the single most important mindset, attitude, that we need to have as sons and daughters of God so we can be the ambassadors for Christ he wants us to be, good husbands and wives and dads and single people, folks who've gone through trials and difficulties but are going to rise back up with God's hand. We need humility. Humility is seeing yourself accurately the way God sees you. And since God made you infinitely valuable, that's a great start, but you know that you have many flaws. So humility is getting down on your knees and saying, God, I can't do it on my own. I need your help, and I need other people in this world. Humans need to belong. They need to be valued. They need to be loved. And the two most important things that we need are an accurate view of God. Who is he? How you view him shapes everything. A lot of people don't view him well because they didn't have a good father and they can't understand the heavenly father is perfectly good, wonderful in every way. He has a better game plan for your life than you do. And number two, it's important what you think of yourself. What's your view of yourself? We're going to talk about that because today there is a blitz on identity, an attack on identity. And we're going to talk about shredding Identity theft, because the enemy comes to steal and lie, and he's been stealing our identity in Christ. Genesis chapter 3, 
is where things go, started to go south. And in pride, Satan rebelled, and then he tricked Adam and Eve. In fact, he deceived Eve and met Adam, stood by passively, and let her get tricked. And they both ate of the apple, saying, God, I don't exactly trust you. I think our way is better. We'll do it our way. And you and I have been making the same bad choice ever since. And that deception, that attack, that blitz was basically on God's identity and our identity. The answer to all this is to see God for who he really is accurately. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And to receive our identity. Did you hear what I said? Receive. You don't earn your identity. I'm not an NFL quarterback. I'm not a former NFL quarterback. I'm not a speaker at this church. I'm the son of God. I'm the husband of Stacy, the son of Jack and Joanne Kemp. I have brothers and sisters that I'm related to, and I have children that I'm related to. But most importantly, I'm a soul, not a body. And I live forever, and so do you. You are not a body with a soul. You are a soul with a body. Do you get that? And God doesn't make bad things. He just makes things that need him to fix them so they can live forever and then live well here abundantly as his ambassadors. Let's take a look at blitzes. Blitzes are attacks where a defense throws a lot of people at the offense and they can't block them all and something really dangerous might happen, okay? But there's also some possible good things. Who's of Chinese descent or understands the Chinese language? Any of you? In the Chinese language, the word crisis has two symbols. The first one is what? Anyone know? Danger. The second is opportunity. A crisis is a dangerous situation that also represents opportunity. That's exactly what a blitz is in football. Something either really bad or really good could happen. My last season of pro football was 1991. I was playing for the Seahawks, and uh, we were on Sunday night football, playing on national TV against the Raiders, and the game went really well until the fourth quarter where we got kind of cautious trying to sit on our lead, and they came back, tied the game. Over time, I threw the ball to a friend of mine, and he caught it. Problem was, he was on the other team. <laughs> his name was Ronnie Lott. He's in the Hall of Fame. I'd been a friend of his when we were teammates on the 49ers with Tony, and uh, in overtime, they just put the kicking team on the field because it was on R20 and they just kicked the ball, scored the field goal, beat us in overtime, sudden death. Two days later, coach calls me and said, hey, sorry, I know you started three game, uh, six games for us and won three and lost three. Uh, I don't really want to do this, but the owner uh, wants to cut you. You're gone. I lose my job as a starting quarterback, middle of the season. That's why they call it the NFL. Not for long. So that night, I'm not a Seahawk anymore. Have I lost my identity? Uh-uh. But it's hard to remember that because we wrap up a lot in our job and our performance, don't we, men? We women wrap up a lot in what people say of us, what they think of us, and what that mirror says. The mirror lies. The mirror lies. Our young daughters are subject to Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, bullying, comparison, catty little girls, boys that are consumers that want to take rather than to give. They want to take value rather than add value. And if a daddy and a mommy don't build in that young woman that she's worth an infinite amount and she's beautiful on the outside and she's beautiful on the inside, then she's susceptible to trouble. Our identity is on the inside and my wife was reminding me of my identity that night. She put the special plate at my spot at the table with our little six-year-old, four-year-old, and one-year-old boy. We have one more now. They're in their 20s and 30s. And uh, she started saying nice things to me, which is what we do with the special plate on birthdays or when you get an A at school or you could lose your job, things like that. Uh, <laughs> I love your dad, boys, because he's a good man and he loves God. He wants to learn. He's committed to us. <sighs> I just lost my job, and I'm now crying at the dinner table because my wife is defining my identity as my character and my faith. My little boys, they start saying, I love Daddy because he plays with me. I love Daddy because he's a good football player. Six-year-old elbows him and says, be quiet. He just got cut. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says the prayer. Kyle says, dear God, thanks for the food, and thanks for Daddy. Please give him a new team. I want him to be on the Eagles. Amen. 
And Stacey and I are like scratching our heads. He doesn't even watch pro football or know that the Eagles are a, are a pro team. His soccer team is named the Eagles because Isaiah 40, 31, Mount Up with Eagles, Wings is our family Bible verse, and he named the team. And he wants Daddy to be on the same team. So he prayed, and God does what? Has the Philadelphia Eagles GM call me the next morning, the next morning, and say, hey, Jim, uh, Randall Cunningham broke his leg this season, and our, our backup quarterback, Jim McMahon, just sprained his ponytail. <laughs> How soon can you get out here? I'm in Philly the next day, and four weeks later, we're in the House of Pain in Houston playing the number two defense in the league, super tough defense, with our number one defense, and the game is terrible for quarterbacks. Hall of Famer Warren Moon is getting smashed by our defense. Jim McMahon's getting smashed by their defense, and I'm thinking, I don't really want to play tonight. <laughs> we're losing six to three when they knock Jim Mc McMahon, who's a tough guy, out of the game, and I get to come in, and I'm about to run this play at the 20-yard line, and it's going to take forever to drop back seven steps and throw it, tight end running the slow corner out. And I'm calling signals 425, 425, thinking there's no way this play's going to work. I don't have time for a three-step drop back, much less a seven. But this, I notice, is linebackers starting to come at me and the free safety starting to come at me who leaves his spot at the goal line to cover the deep pass. And he's sneaking like a snake in the grass and then charging full speed at me. They have seven people rushing. We only have five or six to block. This is a blitz, an all-out attack. In the next couple seconds, either something really, really bad or really, 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 really what? Good is about to happen because blitzes are crises that have danger and opportunity. Suffice to say, everyone on our team changed what they did, sacrificed for the others. I changed my drop. Keith Jackson changed his route, and I threw the ball, got hit in the face, landed with a 200-pound man on me, and Keith caught a touchdown pass, and we won 13-6 to because the blitz turned from bad to good in a matter of seconds. In life, your blitzes don't turn around so quickly. But Jesus took the ultimate blitz on the cross. Father, I'd rather not drink this cup and go to the cross and bear the sin of the world if this is the only way to save the world. Not my will, but thy will be done. And it was a blitz because it looked like a total failure and rejection and loss. But God turned it around because that's his specialty. Read the book of Genesis, chapter 50, 51, something like that, about Joseph. His life turned around. Did you know that Jesus not only took the ultimate blitz, but Jesus predicted the blitz for you and me? He said, in this world, you're going to get blitzed. But don't panic. I've overcome the world. Jesus loved football. It's the greatest sport in the world. <laughs> you don't have the NFL version of the Bible? In the ESV, I think it says something different. Oh, there's the NFL version. In this world, you're going to be blitzed, but take heart. ESV, NIV, excuse me, I've told you these things. You can have peace in me. In this world, you'll have trouble, but take heart, I overcame the world. God uses trouble, hardship, trials, difficulties to draw us to him, to conform our character to Christ, to give us a testimony and a blessing to others because they don't want to hear about your Super Bowl rings and all the easy things in your life and, oh, isn't God good? That doesn't change lives. God loves me unconditionally and can help carry me through anything. I can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives me strength. Philippians 4.13. That's what blitz is for. Apostle Paul loved football too. He strategized how he told how Jesus faced blitzes in Romans. Let's look at verses 3 to 5 of chapter 5 in Romans. Here Paul lays out how we, as believers in Jesus, handle our hardships, difficulties, losses, and the yucky stuff that happens in our life that we didn't want to have happen. The first part was saying we have salvation and eternal life with God, and we celebrate it, we rejoice in it, but we also rejoice in our blitzes, that's what the NFL version says. Tribulations and trials and difficulties, knowing tribulation brings about perseverance. Perseverance brings proven character. Jesus is proven character. And proven character brings about hope, which the world is dying for. And hope doesn't disappoint because the love of God is poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit when we stop looking for an IRA or a better paycheck or a nicer body or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or an easier set of circumstances to make us happy. And we realize those things are temporary. What we really have is joy. And joy is based not in circumstances, but in the ultimate vertical relationship with God, the perfect father, who gave his son the sacrifice and then planted the Holy Spirit in you and me so that everything we do is controlled by him, not us. And right now as I speak, God's controlling me. I asked him to be in control. 
I don't get any credit for this. You say, good talk, Jeff. Way to go. Nice sermon. I have to say, thank you, but God did this. That's the way you live, husbands. You love your wife that way. That's the way you live, wives. Single people, that's how you stay pure, chaste, holy, dedicated to God, investing in the future. Maybe you'll be single for life to do ministry and not being encumbered by the challenges of marriage. Let God write your love story. Don't get desperate and be thinking you need someone else to be whole. You are whole in Jesus Christ, single people. And if he writes a love story, then you have invested in that person by saying, I don't need to explore the world's cheap counterfeits. I already know who I am. And this is a world of cheap counterfeits, isn't it? Movies, entertainment, pornography. Now, celebrating and rejoicing in our blitzes, I was teaching that for a while, that we really got to be excited about the blitz. Well, quarter, quarterbacks in the NFL are excited about the blitz because they want the, the, the man-to-man coverage with no free safety and the opportunity that it brings. But we don't root for cancer, losing our job, having our kid get addicted to drugs. We don't root for these things, and we don't need to. They'll come anyway. Jesus said they're coming. And we really can't even handle them well the way this says, unless we rejoice in something bigger, better, and eternal. And so let's go to verses 1 and 2 of Romans chapter 5 as we see Paul's strategy for blitzes that begins with celebrating the most important thing. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we've also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Jump up, stand, you guys. you got energy. Stand up. Pretend you're an NFL linebacker. Get ready for the offense. You plant your feet firmly. Stick them down on the ground. Get firm. You can take a hit, all right? You can give a hit. We stand in grace. We don't stand in performance. We don't stand in church attendance. We don't stand in giving money away. We don't stand in not doing bad stuff or doing enough good stuff. You can never do enough to earn more of God's love. And you can never do any bad stuff to lose his love. You can never lose his love if you've given your life to Christ. You stand in grace. This church stands for grace on faith based in the scripture. Read Ephesians and you'll learn all about it. There's wind, there's waves, there's trials, there's blitzes, but you stand in faith and God will never let you go. Remember this. This is physical. This is emotional. This is spiritual. It's a memory. Sit down. Please. (laughs) I got kind of bossy. He was treating you like a team. Ready, break. Let's go. Your biggest treasure is Jesus and salvation. If you rejoice in that first thing in the morning, all through the day, and as soon as you start to whine, complain, or criticize your husband, or defend yourself to your wife in a way that says, I don't care about your feelings, I'm not wrong, I'm too proud to admit my faults. Any of you husbands ever do that? I have. As soon as you begin to do that, you say, wait a minute. Oh, gosh, I don't belong to me. I have a much better thing than circumstances. I have Jesus. I have eternal life. I have salvation. I have love. I got to get back to being thankful that I'm saved. And as soon as you do, you'll get humble. And as soon as you get humble, you'll become the Jesus wife, the Jesus husband, the Jesus high schooler, the Jesus college kid, the Jesus person, the Jesus boss, I mean employer, or the Jesus employee that you need to be. Rejoice so greatly in what God has done, giving you eternal life, that then when the blitz comes, you said, okay, here's an opportunity. Let's make it count. Does that make sense, you guys? Now, one of the challenges in Christianity is a lot of people think they're Christians, and they got this insurance policy faith, and they might um, have the label Christian, but it's not every day and they're not feeling peace, joy, power. They don't feel Holy Spirit led, and they kind of want to be in control of some of their life. They have some sin on the side. They pretend, they pose, they, they act because they haven't fully received Jesus. Cole, throw me the ball. I'm going to catch this. Okay, I caught the ball. I caught Jesus. I caught faith in God. I'm a believer now. It's pretty cool. I got this job. I got this job. I got, I got things I want to do. I got married. I like, I like to do all sorts of stuff. I'm going through life, and life's pretty good. You know, it's cool. Uh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven when I die. That's great. But I, I, what happened? The defense just came along and knocked the ball out of my hand because I wasn't holding it firmly. How about let's try another one, Cole? 
I'm going to receive the ball this time and not just catch it. All right, I got it. Man, get your arms out. Pump the ball out like those defenses do in the NFL. Punch it out, man. Harder, come on. I'm just a little wimpy quarterback. Smack it out. Come on, do something to it. Oh, it's not you. You're good. You missed up my leg. Sacrilege. Sacrilege. To catch is this, and then to go on to something else. To receive is this. Cover this tip, this tip, tuck it away. If they all come around you, wrap it up with two arms. Do not let go of the ball. Jesus is your greatest joy, your greatest identity, your greatest future, your greatest treasure. You don't need to become a weirdo Christian, but you ought to be pretty wild and excited. (laughs) All right? And you start the morning that day, and you live that way all through the day. That is how you will get your identity back from the enemy who steals it. In the NFL, we have strategies for beating blitzes, but we people think we can get through life without blitzes, forgetting that Jesus said, you're going to get blitzed, so have a strategy. Here's his strategy, pulled from the scripture. I explain it in this book, Facing the Blitz, three strategies for turning trials into triumphs. Number one, have a long-term view. Don't look at the moment, the weekend, the month. Look at 10 years and look at eternity. Single mom, Rita, faces a blitz. Husband is unfaithful, divorces her, leaves her. She wanted to stay married. She has a 10-year-old son, raising her by herself, similar to many women in America. And her son breaks his arm and is put in a cast at the beginning of baseball season, and he is depressed and mad that he can't play, wants to quit the team. And his mommy, Rita, has her identity in Christ. Her joy can't be beaten by her husband's blitz. And she recognizes there's opportunity in this crisis of her son's broken arm. And she says, son, I don't think you should quit the team. I've seen in life, school, homework, baseball, hard work, you're committed. You have such a character of commitment. I think even though you'll never play this year and hit or pitch, you should stick with the team, stay on the team, go to every practice, every game, encourage all the kids. You be the one that helps the kid who feels bad about themselves, feel good about themselves. You cheer for everyone. If you do that, you'll demonstrate your character of commitment, which someday is going to make you a great husband and an awesome daddy. Was she disqualified because she'd been divorced? No. She used her blitz to bless her son because she had a long-term view. The second strategy is be willing to change. Don't do the same thing you were going to do. Audibleize, sight adjust, get humble, do it differently. There was a husband, hardworking guy, little league coach, Boy Scouts, made the money, brought it home, but... He came home one time and found out that his wife had an affair with another man, actually caught this couple together. It was horrific, terrible, rotten. It was a blitz. But he did something rare that a Jesus person should do. He walked away from the moment, thought about himself, and spent a day asking God, God, what happened and what have I done or not done to let my wife fall out of love with me and into an affair with this man, a friend of his? And the man heard that he hadn't been really loving his wife well. He'd been paying attention to lots of other stuff. And he went to her first and initiated an apology. He said, I want to apologize to you for being focused on lots of good things, but not the best thing. I haven't prioritized you or our marriage, and I want to apologize for not loving you as I should as a husband. Will you forgive me? Humility. Not pointing the finger at her log in her eye, but taking a look at his. And guess what she did? She cried confessed, begged for forgiveness, said, let's go to counseling, let's go to the pastor, and they got rebuilt to have a stronger marriage after the blitz than before. God turns bad to good. Do not be overcome by evil, overcome it by good, Romans 12, 21. Long-term view, willing to change, and a focus on others by being an investor, not a consumer. Philippians chapter 2 says, don't do anything out of pride or selfishness. Boy, that ruins a lot of the things I do. But in humility of mind, consider other people more important than yourself. And don't just look out for your interests, look out for the others. You know what that verse is? It's the investor verse. It's the NFL quarterback and wide receiver verse. Quarterbacks are taught in the summer to throw the football to one foot diameter accuracy to the wide receivers. Not low, high, behind them or in front of them. Make it easy to catch so they look good, their job is easy and they can succeed. But receivers are taught in a separate meeting room, just with receivers. If you can touch it, you must what? Catch it wherever it is. Expect a lot of yourself, less of them, serve them to make them succeed. Do you see the investor mentality? What if the receiver 
was told he's really special. It's all about him. You're the consumer. And the ball was thrown way back here on a play that was third and eight. The team needed the catch. And he thought, if I go back there, that guy's chasing me. He's going to hit me. This guy's coming, and he's going to hit me. I might get hurt. So he bats the ball down and waits for a good one-foot diameter pass because he deserves it. Guess what? No catch, no first down, no touchdown, no win, no playoffs, no Super Bowl. We all lost because we converted an investor to a consumer. And I'm not talking about football. I'm talking about marriage, Christianity, friendship, fathering, mothering. Please do not want your kids to get great grades and get into college and be first string on the team and do great at dance or whatever it is to make you look good. That's a consumer parent. Steward your children. Find their bent. Model humility. Empower them to be good in character, in faith. That's what you really encourage. That's an investor parent. Okay, so to wrap up, our identity is being blitzed, and we regain it by remembering these key spiritual principles. The scriptures will go up real quickly. You should write them down and study them later because I didn't save time. Romans 8, 28, and 9 says, All things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose, which is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Your identity is his purpose, to be conformed to Christ. Number two, Jesus got baptized, and his dad said to him before he began his ministry, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, my beloved son. Identity is received, and if he gave you the righteousness of Christ, then he can say, you're my beloved daughter, and you're my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That's Matthew 3, 16 to 17. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, God made Jesus, who never ever sinned, to take sin upon himself so that you and I could become the righteousness of Christ. God knows who you are in heaven when you're perfect, and he sees the beginning from the end in one moment. Therefore, he sees you that way now. Can you see yourself as loved, forgiven, changed, growing, an ambassador for Christ? Accept your identity from him by relating vertically before you get busy with horizontal activity and relationships. And then the Gideon principle is in Judges chapter 6, where Gideon's a scared 19-year-old guy, and God shows up before he's a great general, and he says to him, Gideon, the Lord is with you, O great and mighty man of valor. Speak character, faith, and identity into young people before they even are expressing it based on who God says they are. All right, so we wrap up with remembering. You can't just call yourself a Christian and catch a little God. You got to receive him all the way. All right? And there's a blitz on your identity, and you get the true identity from God. And the ultimate decision in life is, I'm going to stop running my own life, and I'm going to let God own it because I've got an ownership problem. The guy I'm managing my life now doesn't do it as well as the one who invented me. Give full ownership to him. Ladies, I'd like you to stand up, and Pastor Norman, join me here for a moment. We're going to pray over you. Ladies, stand up. Young ladies, like six-year-old girls, stand up. <laughs> Just keep your eyes open and, and look at Norman and, and look at myself, and we're going to do our best to represent your, your Heavenly Father, your perfect dad. And he says to you that based on your faith in Jesus Christ, that you humbled yourself to accept him and that you're a soul that now will live forever with him. You are his beloved daughter in whom he is well pleased because he's given you the righteousness of Christ. And your beauty is external. Yes, don't let a mirror lie to you, but it's internal. And you are gifted with relationships and love and empathy and compassion and nurturing, creativity and beauty. You're his daughter. Accept that identity, live into that identity, and be an ambassador of love to others. You're awesome. You're equal to men. And we need your help like crazy, especially husbands. Men, stand up. And boys, who will become men. The Father in heaven says this about you. Dude, you got what it takes. I made you. You're a stud. I respect you. 
you know I love you, but you're not so sure I like you. I like you because I forgave all your sin and I see who you're going to be in heaven. I'm giving you credit for that right now. Your anger, your lust, your dumb things, your immaturity, your passivity, it's a thing of the past. Jesus forgave it. Accept your identity now as my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Every one of you men, if you've accepted Christ, which is why I said receive him. Don't fake it. You're his beloved sons in whom he's well pleased. You're ambassadors for Jesus Christ. You are needed in the lives of your sons and daughters, grandsons and granddaughters, boys and girls who don't have mommies or daddies, and the people at work who've never heard that they are a good man or a good woman because God loves them, okay? Men, you're ambassadors for Christ. You are important. I say this message from up here, so does he. That means nothing nearly compared to them doing it every week where they live, in a small group, with your friends, at this church, which is a whole bunch of little huddles going out to change the world. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Change us, give us our identity, and help us be awesome ambassadors, first in our marriages and with our kids and with those who don't know the love of God. For the name of Christ and the glory of Christ, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.